Welcome to the Organic Chemistry Podcast, Dr. Brian Lloyd's Scribblecast of Organic Chemistry Lectures and Solutions to Homework Problems. In the last Scribblecast lecture, we introduced dicarboxylic acids, looked at, looking at their nomenclature, structure, and acidity. In this lecture, we're going to examine the reactions of these types of dicarboxylic acids. Here I've drawn a 4-carbon containing dicarboxylic acid, common name succinic acid. We can recall the name succinic if we use the memory aid comms gap. Each letter of the word comms gap represents an atom. So C is one atom, O is two atoms, N is three atoms. S for succinic acid is four atoms. A four atom dicarboxylic acid under IUPAC is referred to as butane dioic acid. Succinic acid has sufficient atoms that it can cyclize, producing a five-membered ring of minimal ring strain. How do you get a five-membered ring? Well, it's drawn here. If we apply high temperatures such as 300 degrees Celsius, we can cause succinic acid to lose water. The loss of water occurs because the OH of one carboxylic acid nucleophilically adds to the carbonyl. The oxygen is kicked out, the proton is lost, water is formed, and you produce what is called a cyclic anhydride. So succinic anhydride is an example of a cyclic anhydride. Note the nomenclature. It is referred to as an anhydride because water has been lost. So it's an anhydrous molecule. Also, when naming anhydrides, you drop the acid ending of the parent carboxylic acid, and you just add the word anhydride. Now, this type of reaction will work for any molecule, molecule that can form a ring structure of minimal ring strain. For example, I can take this dicarboxylic acid. Apply heat. and produce a six-membered ring. Again, a six-membered ring is of low ring strain. Remember our memory aid comms gap. We have one, two, three, four, five carbons. That's a pentane dioic acid. Using comms gap, C-O-M-S-G, G for glutaric acid. Be careful, glutaric and glutamic, the amino acid, glutamic, are easy to mix up. Don't mix those names up. Glutaric acid becomes glutaric anhydride. Another molecule that undergoes this reaction reasonably well is this dicarboxylic acid. You say that looks like succinic acid. Well, it's succinic acid with a double bond. Do you recall what acid that is? Where the carboxylic acid groups are cis around the double bond. Well, clearly, that acid is maleic acid. Maleic acid, when reacted in this method, 
will eliminate water and produce maleic anhydride. You notice all these structures, all these dicarboxylic acid produce structures of low ring strain, six atom, five atom rings. This reaction works and the formation of cyclic anhydrides function because of the low ring strain found in the product molecules. What is the mechanism of formation? Well, let's go back to our succinic acid. As I suggested previously, the, and actually let's put the carbons here. The oxygen at high temperature will be violently swinging around and a lone pair on the oxygen can nucleophilically attack the delta plus on carbon. There's a delta plus here on this carbon caused by the delta minus on the oxygen. The pi electrons will move out to the oxygen. And when this happens, you end up producing an intermediate species that looks like this. Leaving one lone pair here. O minus and OH. That puts a positive charge here. Now under these high temperatures, even though hydroxide's a poor leaving group, you can kick OH out because we form the carbonyl. The high temperature isn't really necessary to drive out the hydroxide. It's more necessary to cause the conformational changes to allow this oxygen to collide with that carbonyl. And very quickly, as you can imagine, if OH- is kicked out, it immediately kicks out that proton. So the OH-, if you like, combines with the H+, to become H2O. And you get... your anhydride. Now there is an excellent alternative to the high temperature. You actually can use anhydrides which are very reactive with water. Hence they abstract water very well. You can use one high anhydride to react with a dicarboxylic acid and remove water forming a new anhydride. How? Well, let's consider two molecules. Suppose I have something that looks like this. An aromatic ring. Off of this aromatic ring, I have a CH2 and a C double bond O, OH. Over here, I have a carboxylic acid. What's interesting is if I count from one carboxylic acid to the other, I have one, two, three, four, five carbons, and if I made an anhydride, I would have a six-atom ring, which is 
a stable, ideal ring structure. Now, instead of applying heat, suppose I throw in this molecule. Now, if I look at this molecule and I focus in on one half of it, say that half, okay, that molecule is derived from acetic acid or ethanoic acid. In fact, it looks like two ethanoic acids came together and lost water. So this molecule if two came together and kicked out water, I would get this molecule, and hence it's ethanoic and hydride, or the common name is acetic and hydride. Now acetic and hydride is an excellent dehydrating reagent because it's very reactive with water because when it reacts with water, it becomes two carboxylic acids. If you add water to it, the anhydride will become two carboxylic acids. Now, if the water's not available in solution as water, but existing on another molecule, thusly, then acetic acid can react, scavenge water, making two of these, and if the water comes from here, this molecule will become a new anhydride. There we go. And we'll form this new anhydride having abstracted water generating two acetic acids. So these, if you like, are two CH3 C double bond OOH. Often you will do this reaction at higher temperatures, high enough temperatures to remove acetic acid. So you may be above the boiling point of acetic acid. So we can use, where we want to use lower temperatures than 300 degrees Celsius, we can form the anhydride. Another way would be to just trap out the carboxylic acid okay, and collect or isolate the organic anhydride. If the molecule is uh, solid, it can be recrystallized. If it's uh, liquid, it can be um, distilled, so it can be purified. What happens if we attempt to do this, though, this type of reaction, on a molecule that will not give you an optimal ring structure? What do I mean? Suppose I examine a molecule like malonic acid. Malonic comms gap COM has three carbons in it. It is a propane dioic acid. Now, if I was to apply, theoretically, the same reaction, assume that it can do the same thing, I could apply some heat to this molecule, and I would expect it to form something like this. Now the only problem with forming something like this type of molecule is the strained ring. Malonic anhydride is not stable. It is a four atom ring. Four atom rings have significant ring strain caused by angle and torsional strain. Malonic anhydride 
would not be thought to easily form. And if you're doing it at high temperatures, it probably would fall apart due to heavy ring strain. So what does happen if you heat this molecule? Well, if you heat this molecule, what actually happens is you produce CH3, C double bond O, OH. And a gas is produced. CO2 gas is given off. Clearly, some reaction is taking place in which this CO2 is being expelled from the molecule. How can that happen? In order to understand the reaction, we have to take a close look at the mechanism. Now, I can draw malonic acid in a slightly different conformational arrangement. I can envisage the molecule adopting an orientation where the H hydrogen bonds to the lone pair on the carbonyl. And What's interesting in this is I can envisage an electron motion induced by high temperatures causing a rearrangement in this molecule as follows. And I can draw a transition state which shows this movement of electrons quite nicely. Okay, now I'm going to break the molecule into two parts. I'm going to use black, if I can select black, to represent the CO2 gas. And blue to represent what will become the carboxylic acid. And I'm going to draw, maybe we should start with the oxygen. Here is this oxygen. And I'm going to draw a bond forming on the oxygen. A bond breaking on the hydrogen. And in fact, let's use black for bond forming, and we'll use blue for bond breaking. Maybe we should use different colors. Uh, maybe that's good. Yeah, let's try some different colors here. How about red for bond forming? And green for bond breaking. Okay, so I'm going to have a bond breaking here,
Okay. Now what's interesting is all of the green bonds are bond breaking. And all of the red bonds are bond forming. So we have bond forming there. We have bond forming there. And we have bond forming here. Bond breaking. Bond breaking, bond breaking. And this is a transition state. So, make some room up here. What does this transition state suggest? Why are these bonds, when heated, breaking and forming in the pattern that is drawn in the transition state? Well, this transition state is a direct result of a paracyclic movement of electrons. That is, what happens is the electrons, remember the hydrogen bonding interaction is one of positive and negative charges attracting each other. It's not really a bond. But these two electrons move towards the oxygen to make a bond. These pi electrons here move to this carbon to make an alkene, and this carbon-carbon sigma bond ruptures. And notice you're getting a circular movement of electrons when this happens. This carbon bond is the green one here that breaks, and it forms this new pi bond that's drawn in red here. The hydrogen-oxygen bond breaks, that's a green bond, and it forms a hydrogen-oxygen bond over here. And the pi bond to this oxygen, which is green, breaks and forms a pi bond to carbon. So when this molecule falls apart in this fashion, the black unit, the C double bond O that forms, I'll draw bent in the position it originally was. and that's your CO2 gas, you then have a C, okay, and this of course was CH2, there were two H's here, so we have our C with two H's, now has a double bond to it, and off of that is a C with a double bond O. Well, that double bond O became a single bond O with an H attached to it, so COH. And there's another OH. Well, what kind of functional group have I formed? I formed an ene diol. Now, we learned that enols are unstable and tautomerized. Well, likewise, enediols will tautomerize. Enediols will tautomerize. If you like, what I can do is dump in two electrons 
Well, let's, we'll look at that. What do they totemize to? These two electrons go down here. That produces a C minus. Grab a proton, lose a proton here. I'll get a CH3. C double bond O. OH. Acetic acid is the totemer of this ene diol and it's more stable in the carboxylic acid structural totemeric form. It may be hard to see how the ene diol can convert to that, so I might as well take a little bit of time and just draw, if I can, how this ene diol can do that. Well, first I can draw a resonance structure for the ene diol where I moved a lone pair into a high mode here, those two electrons out. This, of course, will be a minor contributor and you'll now begin to see how we're getting closer to the carboxylic acid. There's now a lone pair here. Clearly this is a very minor contributor. But you see, all we have to do to get to the acetic acid now is pick up a proton, plus H+. Plus. That will turn the CH2- minus into a CH3. And then all we have to do is lose a proton So, uh, actually, let's make the bottom one this way, the top one, that way, that way, I can write it on top. Now it's minus H plus as we remove this proton, and we get our acetic acid. So tautomerization, if you recall, is a process in which you move pi electrons and shift one or more protons. And so ene diol, through this process of tautomerization, converts to the carboxylic acid. This cyclic transition state is key to this transformation. Notice that the cyclic transition state has an optimal, optimal six-atom ring structure, but it still requires heat for this transformation to occur. Now the heat that must be used must be increased as the ring structure deviates from the ideal six-membered ring system. We can actually do this reaction with a molecule of oxalic acid. But if I try to draw oxalic acid, in a ring structure, oops, that's an OH over here, where I put the OH up, we see we get a five-membered ring, not a six-membered ring, and as such, more heat will be required. Typically, oxalic acid can be forced to undergo the decarboxylation, but it will require 150 degrees Celsius. Okay, so 150 degrees Celsius. If we do that, we kick out the CO2, and that leaves the CO2H with two H's, and we quickly form formic acid. Plus CO2 gas. So this works for both malonic acid and oxalic acid. The reaction mechanism is referred to as decarboxylation 
because we're removing a carboxyl group, decarboxylation. of beta dicarboxylic acids. This beta decarboxylation is this de decarboxylation of beta dicarboxylic acids refers to the original reaction with malonic acid. If we isolate the functional group, we have an alpha carbon and a beta carbon. On oxalic acid, if we isolate the functional group, it would be decarboxylation of what? Carboxylic acid is on the alpha carbon next door, and so it would be an alpha dicarboxylic acid. So oxalic acid is an alpha dicarboxylic acid. Malonic acid is a beta dicarboxylic acid. But both mechanisms or both reactions are example, examples of decarboxylation reactions. Okay. Well, that's it for the reactions of dicarboxylic acids. Next Scribblecast lecture, we're going to begin looking at the derivatives of carboxylic acids, those molecules which, when reacted with water, produce carboxylic acid. We've already examined and introduced them in the preparation and formation of carboxylic acids. We're going to review their uh, uh, structures again and then begin looking at each functional group of derivative carboxylic acids individually, looking at the preparation and reactions as well as nomenclature. I'm Dr. Brian Lloyd. This is my Scribblecast. I thank you for listening.